If not, let's jump then into tonight, uh, following Jesus in evangelism by looking at the word consecration. The previous slide showed you just those one word titles that we've been using to describe what we do as it relates to being what Jesus wants us to be, and that is his followers. Uh, we have his revelation, but we also have uh, his understanding that uh, as we spoke of last week, that we are to have his association. That is, we associate with him, we follow in his dust. Uh, that's what the rabbis would teach uh, their students to do. Follow close enough that the dust that is kicked up off of my feet along these dusty roads uh, lands on you. Well, that's a close proximity for sure, uh, but it involves just how uh, they were to be so intimately involved with their teacher. And today, while we do not have the privilege of doing that physically, as many did in the first century, uh, we can still do that by reading and studying God's Word. Uh, tonight, consecration. Well, what does that word mean? That's one of those um, Bible words, one of those church words that, you know, it's spoken and it bounces off the walls in this facility, but it really doesn't connect if you use it around the water cooler. Uh, or, you know, in some other setting, Monday through Saturday. I, I don't know even hardly of a, a situation where you could include the word without some sort of religious overtone. It's even an, an archaic word in the English language, by and large, because we're becoming more of a secular kind of people. So what does the word consecration mean? Well, let's think about it this way. And uh, this is something that I forget who I first read that suggested this question, but it really made me ponder. What did Jesus value more highly in people? Ability or loyalty? What did he value more highly? Loyalty. What do we value more often in people? Ability, I think. Now, Again, depending on the circumstance, uh, we might change our answer. But uh, we like for people, uh, we like them to have ability if we're going to have a relationship with them. Usually there's something in that relationship, some component of it, of course, that that person meets a need for us. And selfishly, we would like to think, you know, we're so benevolent that we are just giving of ourselves and the relationship is just based we say well we love people and so you know we're looking out for their best interest and uh, that's true but even then uh, in the final analysis we recognize there must be some give and take if it's just a one-way street in that relationship pretty soon uh, you're going to grow weary burnout resentful a lot of other emotions that we could list but when you think about ability or loyalty, which is more important for Jesus, it seemed that loyalty was much more important than ability. And we talked about that when we talked about that word selection, and we noted the people that Jesus selected to be his followers. These 12 men, uh, by the world standards, had very limited abilities. Perhaps, and although we don't know any of this with exactness, the only one that might have had superior ability and certainly a maybe a more refined upbringing and maybe additional opportunities more so than the others, was Judas Iscariot. He wasn't from Galilee. Matthew, again, might be an exception in that as a tax collector, perhaps, he had received some additional training and maybe some prior uh, schooling, uh, certainly in the ways of the Romans, uh, that might have um, set him apart a little bit from the others, but they were normal, ordinary guys. They were not rabbis in their own right. Uh, they were not uh, those who had uh, been selected to even follow a rabbi or had made any effort to do it to this point, which indicates to me they probably had little interest in furthering their uh, educational standing in that society. And yet Jesus chose them. And he chose them perhaps largely because they were willing to be loyal. And uh, we see that. Consecration is an Old Testament word. It's used especially, uh, well, um, not just especially, but exclusively. There is one version that includes the word in the New Testament, but by and large, if you have a concordance and uh, you look up that word, uh, in most English translations, consecration will not even appear in the New Testament. So you might say, well, what connection does it have with Jesus? We'll get to that momentarily, but just to show you kind of how the word is used, uh, go back to the book of Exodus. People have been brought out of Egypt. God has met them at Mount Sinai. Moses has received the law. 
And so in Exodus 29, verse 22, talking about uh, the priest and how God would set them apart and some of the sacrifices they would make in order to uh, ceremonially celebrate, uh, if you will, this appointment. Uh, the Bible says, take the fat of the ram, the fat tail, the fat that covers the entrails, the fatty lobe attached to the liver, the two kidneys and the fat on them, the right thigh. And then it tells us all of the reason why. It is a ram of consecration. A ram of consecration. Verse 26, take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration. Uh, verse 27, uh, we should read that word again, the ram of consecration. If you jump over uh, to another passage, let me bring it up here. In Numbers chapter 6, the imagery moves from an animal that is consecrated, and we still don't really know exactly what that means, to people. And in Numbers chapter 6, you read what is somewhat of an enigmatic uh, instruction as it relates in verse 2, when either a man or a woman consecrates, so there's the word, consecrates is to make something uh, or to you know, initiate this process of consecration when uh, either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord. And we read that word and we're curious. We keep reading verse number 7 uh, after some intervening instructions about not drinking wine or any similar drink, not even vinegar, nothing about fresh grapes, not even raisins. Uh, all the days of his separation he stays away from that. He doesn't cut the hair on his head. He has uh, done all of that because he shall be, verse 5, holy. He will not go near a dead body, verse 6. Verse 7, he shall not make himself unclean even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister when they die, because of his separation to God is on his head. Verse 9, if anyone dies very suddenly beside him and he defiles his consecrated head, and he shall shave his head on the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day he shall shave it. So there's a lot of other uh, peculiar instructions about uh, this particular um, task, this particular uh, uh, vow uh, that a man or a woman would be making. Uh, the word Nazarite there uh, is not referring just the way my hearing sometimes, and I did this, I guess, in my younger years, maybe in ignorance. I hear the word Nazarite. I go to the New Testament, I read that Jesus was from Nazareth. He was called a Nazarene, and I put those ideas together, and I say, well, this is something of the Old Testament equivalency to that, but it's not relating at all to a geographical location. Here, a Nazarite was not from Nazareth or from that region, and so there's no bearing at all. Uh, the word just simply means one that is separated. And Notice uh, your version will tell you that back in verse 2, taking the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself. Uh, that's what he's doing. Verse 4, all the days of his separation. Context in these clues is giving you the definition of the word, the explanation. Uh, sometimes we can read over it without maybe observing that. Until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself, verse 5, to the Lord he shall be holy. And verse 8, all the days of his separation he shall be holy to the Lord. And so uh, the idea of consecration then is separation to now, of interest, the word in the original language in Hebrew originally meant how something would be set or installed. That's how the word would be used in a secular sense. For instance, uh, if you were building a home, you would set or install your stone. They would use stone more so than we think of kind of wood and piecing together lumber. Uh, but they would set stone, of course, to build. And a uh, skilled stonemason would have to use, of course, different size uh, stones, uh, they were not all uniform as brick are today, and so it would take great st uh, skill in setting them in the right place. And so that's what the word meant. Uh, the word also meant uh, the idea of a crown. Now you might say, how in the world do you get the idea of a crown? Well, the word as it will appear later on uh, in the Old Testament will appear as it relates to a king and how he wears a crown. That's where the word is used as well. And again, the crown probably there is symbolic, not just of a, a ring of gold, but what it represented. Here is one set apart. Here is one separated. Here is one that is different than all the rest. He's the king. Uh, for instance. And so that's the Old Testament idea. And so you come to the New Testament and the word itself doesn't appear. So you might say, well, Jesus, how can we follow Jesus in consecration if the word isn't used at all? Well, there are analogies, illustrations uh, that teach about this idea of separation. 
uh, that Jesus gives us, this idea of consecration, and you've read them, and as I begin to bring them up, you'll know uh, and be able to understand uh, the point I'm trying to make, the parallel we're drawing. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus gives this wonderful invitation. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. We like that. That sounds great. Life has a way of wearing us out. Not just physically, but we often read into it, and I think we do so with no injustice to the words of the Savior. When I'm weary spiritually, when I'm tired emotionally and mentally, when I'm just in, needing, in need of care, who can I go to? The old hymn puts it, where? Where, could, where could I go but to the Lord? Well, I can go to the Lord. Jesus said, I can come to Him. But verse 29 adds, if I come to Him, He gives me responsibilities, instruction. In coming to Him, verse 29, Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now a yoke, uh, it was certainly something that every one of His original readers and hearers would have understood immediately. Uh, today it's somewhat of an obscure uh, reference, but of course it is uh, uh, an implement, a tool uh, that was used in the ancient world to bind two animals together, to pull a cart or a wagon, uh, to use a plow. And uh, most of these were wooden, if you can imagine just kind of a wooden beam with rings of sorts, if you will, uh, that the head of the animal went through. And then as it extended backwards, you could hook up the other things. Uh, uh, we would use, I guess, in this area, and I only have secondhand experience from this, from hearing my father and grandparents and other older gentlemen talk about uh, plowing mules, you'd use a harness. And uh, that would be something maybe comparable for those of you that know what that's about. But take my yoke upon you. Uh, if you take the yoke of Jesus, uh, that involves, you know, some idea of work and commitment. Uh, you put those animals together, uh, you do that so they'll pull in the same direction, so they'll be unified. And the Lord is saying, you can put me with you or I will go with you if you uh, entrust uh, me and uh, we can go together. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, uh, verse 30, my burden is light. This isn't something that's going to require uh, tremendous amounts of strenuous toil in the sense of uh, just thinking Jesus isn't saying, I'm not going to treat you like an animal. Now, the Old Testament law had very specific rules about how well they were to treat their animals. Uh, but that's another lesson for another time. And yet Jesus said, don't fear uh, that you'll be treated you know, just like an animal. You'll be treated much better than that. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. There's extra biblical literature uh, that even suggests Jesus as a carpenter made the best yokes in Nazareth. Uh, I kind of doubt that because actually carpentry in the ancient world uh, was more concerned with being a stonemason. We think of Jesus using a saw and lumber. Maybe he did to some degree, but maybe carpentry that he was involved in might have also included a stonemasonry more than uh, you know, producing wood implements. That's, again, neither here nor there, just a discussion for another day. But they understood. Jesus said, take my yoke. Well, that involves some measure of consecration, of separation, if you're going to come out of the world and come into a relationship with Him. Uh, following Jesus was probably easy at first, but that was only because they had not followed Him very far. You remember Matthew chapter 4, Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 2, uh, all record to us, <clears throat> as well as John chapter 1, Jesus said, follow me. They left everything and followed Him. As we spoke of last week, that was the rabbi reversing the process. Typically, the student would say to the rabbi, can I follow you? And then the rabbi would either accept or refuse. Here was the rabbi, the master teacher, saying to these men, you follow me. And they do so. Was it easy at first? Well, maybe. But uh, Jesus made sure as he began to train these men to help them understand uh, that this is not just, you know, a joy ride, if you want to use that word. Matthew 6, 24, And no man can serve two masters. That's stated as just an obvious truth, but in connection with who Jesus was, uh, He's wanting them to understand. If you're going to show allegiance to me, you cannot serve two masters. Hate the one, love the other. Be loyal to one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, that Aramaic word. Uh, some versions just translate money. I think it's more general than that. The generic idea is you can't serve God in anything that the world offers. You have to choose the world or Him. Either or, you can't choose both. 
Uh, Matthew 10, verse 37, the ministry advances. Jesus continues to challenge them. And this, uh, Luke 14 says it as well. Uh, these words kind of jump off the page when we're reading and we have to kind of, whoa, stop and back up. Did, did he really just say this? Did Jesus, said he, uh, did Jesus really say, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me? And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me? Yeah, that's what he said. And that's what he meant. Our love for him must be supreme. What, what's that involved? What type of uh, commitment are we talking about? Dedication, consecration. That's the word we're using. Matthew 12 and verse 30. This time, again, Jesus making sure uh, that all who heard him, as well as those 12 men that might have followed him most closely, states, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. No one can choose to be Switzerland in the spiritual realm. Everybody knows what Switzerland is known for, right? Switzerland is neutral. I'm not going to take a side. You know, I'm not going to fight either for this side or that side. That group or this group. You know, work it out on your own. Kill each other if you want to. We're just going to stay on the sidelines. We're uh, not going to endorse or provide material support to either, uh, either side. Jesus said that's not an option. We're not with him, we're against him. Now, the way in which we communicate that to people, I don't know. Um, but we need to make some effort to do that, I think. And, you know, maybe that's what's worked against us in our nation's history. We know it's founding, and even though that today is being, as they say, um, you know, reimagined or retold or, uh, you know, um, certainly maybe altered from what it actually was. But uh, we, you know, look at those founding principles and we say, well, you know, Christianity was embedded uh, within many of the ideas and precepts that were held and were actually then uh, codified into law. So we're a Christian nation and people by extension or maybe by default just said, well, okay, I am one too. And even though I don't go to church or read the Bible, don't know really even what Jesus asked of me, I'm, I'm a good person, I'm kind of an American Christian. Well, there's no such thing. There's no idea uh, anywhere in God's Word that one can you know, be a follower of God by default. The same idea uh, even more readily can be observed uh, when people talk about you know, family relationships. Well, my granny, she went to church every Sunday. She was the best woman there ever was. Well, I had a granny like that too, but what does that mean for you? Well, really nothing. It's about how you and the Lord get along. It's what you do individually, personally, your responsibility for Him. So Jesus said, you're either with me or against me. There's just no uh, middle ground. Uh, devotion to Jesus required. Here's another idea that consecration uh, implies. Counting the cost. And um, Jesus didn't uh, tell us here what maybe a modern uh, professor might use in the classroom to say, you know, do a feasibility study. But that's exactly what he's asking of his disciples here. Uh, the feasibility uh, that's uh, studied you know, beforehand, before a business launches, or maybe before it expands or moves to a different location. Uh, Jesus wasn't concerned with earthly business, uh, but he was concerned when he said, if one of you intending to build a tower, Brandon would tell you before he'll give you a construction loan, you better sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it. You can survey, and our real estate folks here tonight could probably point you in the direction. If you want uh, to purchase a half-finished home, you can do that. Someone didn't count the cost. Lest after he has laid the foundation, verse 29, is not able to finish it. All who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, was not able to finish. What king going to war against another king does not sit down first? Consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. If I only had 10 and they had 20, I'd want to make sure my uh, 10 were some bad dudes uh, to be outnumbered 2 to 1. I know you're probably, or at least I do when I read that, uh, go back to remember old Gideon and God says, you know, go fight the Midianites. And he said, okay, and he rouses an army of 32,000. He feels pretty good about that. We don't know exact numbers in the ancient world, but the population probably of Midian uh, was such that they could have had that many soldiers, but not that many more. So Gideon says, okay, it'll be about a one man-to-man -man, uh, battle. And we've got a pretty good shot, and God trims the army down. 
uh, you remember, I think down to 10,000. And then finally, 300 are left. Go fight now, Gideon. And if you do the math, and someone had to do the math for me because I told them to because I, <laughs> I didn't know how, but they did the math for me and came back. And when Gideon wins the battle, you find out he was outnumbered 450 men to one, and he still won. For every 450 soldiers of Midian, Gideon had one, but God had his back, and that was the only one that counted, of course. And those men of Israel were just uh, stewards that God used for uh, that purpose. But the man, the king will send a delegation. Hey, let's make peace. You've got more than I do. What's the point? Is Jesus just talking about construction and warfare? No, likewise, verse 33, whoever you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. That's what we want to be. That's what we're doing. We're following Jesus. But even in evangelism, whoever does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. So consecration to Christ then and being his disciple is demanding. And uh, there's no way, or really there might be a way, but there's no point in trying to overlook or minimize or sugarcoat that reality. Luke 9, 57 and following. They journeyed on the road. Someone said, this unnamed individual, Lord, I will follow you wherever I go. That's what we spoke of um, last week in that selection process. He recognizes Jesus as a rabbi. What do you do? If you want to be a student of the rabbi, you beg to be his follower. And so that's what this man is doing. It's a very noble thing that he's asking. Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. Your dust uh, will be on me. That's the commitment I'm willing to make. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. There's some debate on exactly all that Jesus meant to convey in that. It's likely, I think, that Jesus is just saying, I'm not treated like most rabbis. You won't follow me and be popular. You won't follow me and have it easy. Uh, you'll have a great difficulty if you're going to be my disciple. And we're not told if this man joins uh, the group or not. He said to another, follow me. Now that's always intriguing to me that he tells that guy this, but then he says to another, another unnamed individual, follow me. Same thing he had said to Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and uh, maybe uh, Matthew and the other apostles, disciples now. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Uh, sounds like a reasonable request, doesn't it? Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Now there's a lot in that. Um, Alan Webster asked me to speak on that, so I've got 45 minutes on the PTP website if you want to uh, listen to that. And, and he thought I was you know, qualified as a funeral director. It's a lot more involved than just funeral directing here. But uh, Jesus is saying, you've got to separate yourself. Whether the man's father was dead already or was yet to die, that's, again, in that 45-minute presentation. I won't give you all of that tonight. But Jesus said, you go and preach the kingdom of God. I'm asking you to do something very radical. Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. Uh, one of the other gospel writers in recording this same incident uh, records it where the man says, let me go home and just say goodbye to the folks in essence. Again, sounds like a reasonable request. And Jesus said to that person, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What's the point? Consecration, separation, following Jesus requires dedication. It requires separating ourselves to that purpose. And it's not easy. It's not simple. It doesn't happen naturally or automatically. Uh, but it's a decision that we must make uh, to do so. Now, uh, can you get into the finer details of each of these points? Well, sure you can. Um, um, I use, uh, when I uh, go over it at any length, uh, verse 62, I never had my hand on the plow, but I had my hand on the wheel of a little farm all 140. Some of you know, who knows what a farm all 140 is? Yeah, a few of you, a few of you have no idea what a farm all 140 is with a belly plow. We were plowing tobacco, we'd say backer, but, uh, and my daddy let me do it for the first time, and I was so happy. And so I started down the row, and I got a little bit off, but I corrected it, and to show my father how happy I was that I'd made that correction, I turned around as I was driving and told him, you know, look at what I did. And the look on his face, 
said, you know, things that his shouldn't have come out of his mouth, and they didn't, I don't think. But he was communicating through his look, you better turn back around, because as I turned back around, or as I turned around to show him how good I was doing, what, did ha what happened? I deviated off course. And uh, what's Jesus saying? That's my interpretation of it. Uh, Jesus said, sometimes we start, and, you know, we just want to call attention. Lord, look at how good I'm doing. Uh, look at what, or maybe it's I'm looking back to what I could have had or could have done. And uh, that's not what he would have us to do. So uh, all of that's about consecration, but here is the most poignant instruction. And here's where uh, I want you to think about with me for a few moments uh, this idea of consecration. Matthew chapter 10, verse 38. I'm going to read through these very quickly because they all have the same idea. And you'll notice the very first one and you'll be able to pick up on what it is. Jesus said, He who does not take his cross, follow after me, is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross. Matthew 16, 24. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Uh, flip to Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Mark says, whoever desires to come after me, he's of course quoting Jesus, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Luke chapter 14, we'll go there first and then we'll back up. Luke 14, verse 27, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then Luke 9, 23, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up his cross. And again, that's not exclusive just to men, excluding females, ladies. But if you're going to be my follower, that person, that individual must take their cross and follow me. Well, you may have a cross around your neck. And you wear it as a piece of jewelry, and so you're saying, okay, I'm taking my cross. Well, it's much more than that. Uh, in this day, when Jesus spoke these words in the first century, the cross was, of course, uh, the symbol of, I would say, Roman justice. That may be too generous. Uh, it was a symbol of Roman brutality. And uh, the Assyrians had kind of originated the practice. The Romans, historians say, had perfected it. And convicted criminals would frequently uh, be put to death by means of crucifixion. Uh, we sometimes, or at least maybe the impression is, Jesus was the first guy to ever die on a cross and the two others there that died with him. That's not true whatsoever. Uh, in fact, uh, even as Jesus was a boy, there was an uprising and um, uh, the Roman government swept in and kind of rounded up the instigators and uh, depending on the source that you consult, uh, maybe... Most of them put as few as hundreds, and some would put as many as thousands uh, of Jews were crucified by the Roman government. And they just put them up kind of as road signs to say, you mess with us, this is what you get. And that's a pretty strong deterrent. So uh, Jesus was not the first man to die uh, by crucifixion. His, uh, the effectiveness, the uniqueness of his death is not in how it was accomplished or what happened uh, as he, uh, you know, suffered there. I'm not minimizing that, but what transpired was more important spiritually, if you will, than just what occurred physically. And so Jesus said, you take up your cross. And so the condemned criminal, uh, Rome to add shame and insult, uh, would often, when a man appeared before the tribunal and that was his sentence, uh, they would give him. Uh, the Romans called it the patabulum. It's one of those words that just rolls off the tongue. But it's the big crossbar beam uh, that teed the cross. And most crosses were not little T's. They looked more like capital T's, uh, history tells us. I know ours usually don't look like that. But he would be given that patabulum, probably weighing, uh, again, minimum, maybe 100, maybe several hundred pounds, again, depending on the species of wood, the size, and all of that. It would be placed on that convicted criminal and uh, he would have some sort of placard perhaps put around his neck identifying his crime. And uh, he would then be led through the streets to a place like Golgotha or something similar uh, where his life uh, would be taken uh, sometimes days afterwards painfully through uh, the after effects of the crucifixion process. So when Jesus said, take your cross and follow me, it wasn't put a piece of jewelry around your neck or a charm on a bracelet or, you know, a design on a t-shirt that has a cross. That's not what he meant. It wasn't, um, and there are different guys that do this ever so often. Uh, several years ago, 
I think this might have even happened in the 80s. You remember the guy that walked all the way across the country, you know, carrying a cross, and it made big news? And someone was wise enough, you know, a newspaper person, you know, back when people still read newspapers, you know, snapped a photo of him and people were extolling him, how wonderful that is. But you looked very closely and what happened uh, if you looked very closely down at the bottom of his cross? He had a little axle with wheels on it, didn't he? And I'm not saying that's not a major feat. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I was too young to realize what did he make it out of, you know, two by fours, two by sixes, four by fours. I, I don't know, you know, how much that weighed. I mean, uh, still, it wouldn't be pleasant when I exercise. You know, I don't make a habit of, you know, putting a load of lumber on my back. And, uh, but walking across the country, you know, just pulling it, wheeling it across, as it were. That's not what Jesus is asking these guys to do either. Uh, he's asking them, um, and I can't remember um, who the first author and different ones have uh, repeated it throughout history. You know, when Jesus invites a man to come and follow him, he invites him to come and die. That's really what the call to be a follower of Jesus is, to come and die. So that requires self-denial. You notice that was the preface statement in almost each of these previous occurrences. Any person, any man, any woman, if any individual desires to come after me, let them deny themselves. Deny self, take up the cross, bear the cross, and follow me. So you see, if you will, three ideas that may seem nuanced enough that they're each individual acts, but I would suggest to you maybe uh, they're all one and the same. Self-denial, bearing the cross, and obedience. Now, here's an interesting idea from Luke's gospel. Luke 9.23, Jesus said, Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. And follow me, that adverb there, modifying it. Well, how often do I do it? Daily. Now, I'll ask for your input. Does that inclusion of that word, that modifier, meant to make this instruction easier or harder? What do you think? Easier. We have one vote for easier. Anybody think harder? Those that are students of the original language say almost universally that they would have understood to make it mean it was easier, meaning that it would not automatically be death, but it would be small deaths that they die each day. But is it still hard to be one that self, makes self-denial a part of their practice? Yes. Can we separate any practice, still consider ourselves to be followers? I don't think so, so I won't even give you the why or why not. I'll just answer it for you. Absolute obedience to the will of God, then, and total consecration to the expression of love is what Jesus requests. And all of those verses say basically the same thing. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, obey me. So to do that, we have to abandon our will to give supreme submission to His. Are we willing to die daily? That's what Paul said he did in 1 Corinthians 15, 31. You read that and it just seems nonsensical. What do you mean, I die daily? He's referencing the instruction of Jesus. This is a long quote, but uh, <clears throat> I wanted to produce it in its entirety. There can be no dilly-dallying around with the commands of Christ. We are engaged in a warfare, the issues of which are life and death, and every day that we are indifferent to our responsibilities is a day lost to the cause of Christ. If we have learned even the most elemental truth of discipleship, we must know that we are called to be servants of our Lord and to obey His Word. It is not our duty to reason why He speaks as He does, but only to carry out His orders. Unless there is this dedication to all that we know He wants us to do now, however immature our understanding may be, it is doubtful if we will ever progress further in His life and mission. There is no place in the kingdom for a slacker, for such an attitude not only precludes any growth in grace and knowledge, but also destroys any usefulness on the world battlefield of evangelism. In other words... If we're going to do this task that the Lord has given us, we have to follow Him completely. And the, maybe the reason why we don't do better in that is because we haven't been willing to take up the cross. We've not been willing to deny ourselves. We've not been willing to follow Him as closely as He demands. I'll leave you with this. Do most people choose not to obey because they are ignorant of what Jesus demands? Sometimes we just say, well, if people knew, they'd obey. And it's true that many people are ignorant. They don't know, so they don't know what to obey. Or do they choose not to obey Jesus because they understand what He does demand? I would submit to you there's a lot of people, a lot of people that you know and love like I do, a lot of people you've tried uh, to help. They're not obeying the gospel, not because they don't know what it is or what Jesus offers, but because they do and they're not willing to give it. Maybe that's why we're not 
willing to follow him either. Any questions? Our time has expired tonight, but if you have one, I'll be happy to try to answer it or write Uh Oh, there we go. All righty then. Thank you for your good attention in our class this evening.